Well, this may be somewhat of a uh, unique subject matter. Uh, it's not something that you hear talked about in the coffee shop uh, every Tuesday morning. But uh, it has been one of the most fascinating studies that I've, that I've done. There are some great stories out there. So uh, we'll just get started. What is your interest in cemeteries and undertakers? What could be your fascination of these entities within the Remington School District? Really, it doesn't matter. My intent is to relay sufficient information from my little obscure corner of the world that might inspire others to investigate stories within their own area. Research is so compelling because one never knows just where it might lead or end. If your attendance tonight is due to an interest in ghost stories or an attempt to find graves of ancestors, I'm sorry. That is a totally different class with a different instructor. This presentation is two separate local histories. One is of cemeteries. The other is the evolution of the undertaking profession. As has been stated, our focus area is the Remington School District. It's 253 square miles located in portions of Butler, Harvey, and Sedgwick counties, including the towns of Annalee, Brainerd, Elbing, Hurley, Potwin, and Whitewater. We'll start with the undertakers. This photo was taken from an online collection. Uh, depicts a somewhat romantic image we may have of a bygone era when everything was grand, and every funeral was a parade led by matched horses. Perhaps. Within the previously mentioned towns of our research focus, Brainerd, Whitewater, and Poplin could boast the services of a local undertaker. Most of what we know of the man and business of this service is to be found in newspaper advertising at the time. J.D. Frampton and Company was in business in Brainerd. This ad was published in 1886. It is immediately obvious that undertaking was not his only enterprise, particularly in a small town. An additional source of income was necessary to maintain a livelihood. Sales of furniture was the most common. It only stands to reason. In earlier times, it was the furniture maker who was asked to build the caskets. Eventually, he was the one called on to undertake the logistics of the burial and a simple service. Hence, a profession and a title were born. Titles have changed over the years. The person in charge has been identified as an undertaker, mortician, or a funeral director. The business has been classified as undertaking, mortuary, and funeral home. A rose by any name. Mm -hmm. Regardless, the person given to this critical community infrastructure is committed to an enterprise, is willing to assume responsibility, is able to guarantee completion, and is not inconvenienced by inconvenience. In June 1889, after most of Brainerd and Annalee had moved to the new town of Whitewater, Wharton Weatherby are established as undertakers and include embalming in their advertising. Embalming was made famous by the Egyptians about 3000 BC. It did not become common in Europe until the 1500s when dissection and study of human anatomy was recognized as beneficial for medical purposes. In the U.S., it wasn't until the Civil War that embalming became widespread. Abraham Lincoln, for instance, was the first president to be embalmed. Arsenic was the primary chemical used for embalming until about 1900. Formaldehyde was discovered in 1887. In the United States, embalming is not required even today if burial or cremation is completed within a given period of time. In most European countries, 
embalming is not allowed. So graves can be reused after a set number of years. One more little note of interest, the Hindus require cremation. In October 1889, Wichman had the hardware store. He also advertised coffins, caskets, shrouds, and all things usually supplied by a first-class undertaker. He did not claim to be an undertaker. Wharton Weatherby dissolved their partnership in July 18, uh, 1889. Um, Weichman advertised undertaking supplies in October 1889. Now, three years later, we're told that an infant death of last week was the first local death in nearly three years. An article in September states that the undertaker left town two and a half years ago totally discouraged. We don't know if Weichman actually assumed the responsibilities of undertaker or if an unknown undertaker came to town for a short time. There's no advertising to allow us to fill the gap. It's bad on the undertaker, but it's great for Tom Eilert's mineral water, you see on the last line of the September article. There was a spring just northwest of Whitewater that Mr. Eilert's advertised as a mineral spring. The site actually became a destination for people seeking improved health. May 1899, another gap of time. It's been 10 years since the last mention of undertaking. North Foss came from Newton. J.E. Baker started the funeral business in Peabody in 1897 and is now also in business in Whitewater. In June 1900, a year uh, later, J.E. Baker is on his own in the furniture and undertaking business. April 1903, W.E. Smith operates the furniture business while Baker manages the undertaking business from Peabody. In October of 03, W.E. Smith is operating alone in furniture and undertaking. A month later, C.E. Francis becomes successor to W.E. Smith. Francis sold his old wooden building in 1908 to the livery man, C.B. Dean, to be moved off the site and will build a new 50 by 80 foot brick building. The editor notes, we are very glad to see these substantial business houses taking the place of the old fire traps. We will return to this subject in 1930. Frank Bishop took over the furniture and undertaking business, and by March 1911, he added a barn for his funeral car. Garage was not yet a well-known term. In February of 1917, Hossman, uh, I'm sorry, El, uh, in January of 1917, uh, Elwell and and Huff established the furniture, uh, uh, the Potlin Furniture and Undertaking Company. This is the earliest date noted in Potlin for the undertaking profession. And in February, just a month later, Hossman and Hawk take over the business established by Elwell and Huff. Mr. Hawk is a licensed undertaker, <laughs> being a graduate of the Kansas City School. Darrell, I'm just reading here auto or horse drawn hearse. If you recall, is this the first time there's mention of auto? Well, that happens to be my next paragraph. <laughs> You're right on. <laughs> when Frank Bishop built a barn for his funeral car in 1911, that was the first indication of a motorized hearse. Here, Hossman and Hawk advertise an auto or horse drawn. So the transition is happening here, but some people still have the preference of the horse. 
<clears throat> On October 2, 1921, Mr. Bishop was returning to Whitewater from a funeral he had conducted at Gnadenburg Church, now known as Grace Hill. You're familiar with that, aren't you? Oh, at least on Sundays. Okay. <laughs> His auto hearse stalled or was hung up on the Rock Island tracks on the north edge of town. Oh, my. Train number 11, due at 512, came in on time at a speed of about 40 miles per hour. Mr. Bishop was found to be alive after the crash, but died en route to Newton without regaining consciousness. He is attended at the cemetery by other businessmen in Whitewater. From left um, is uh, Paul Ross, partner of the Whitewater Mill, and later the Ross Mill in Newton and in Ottawa. Oliver Neal, Ford dealer, the third man is not identified. Joe Motter, the barber and Whitewater's baseball umpire, and he was also the taxidermist. Uh, Herman Brune, blacksmith. Harry Mauer, realtor. Arthur Penner, general store owner. J.B. Hazlett is a drugstore owner. Paul Hanstein was officer in the People's State Bank in Whitewater, as well as other enterprises. Uh, Levi Zimmerman was a partner in the Whitewater Mill. So this is kind of the who's who of Whitewater business at that time. And uh, such an array of flowers, I don't know that one has ever seen before or after. Now, may I ask, do you have any knowledge of costs for a service from an undertaker? No, I, that was never advertised. I, I'm not familiar with that. Right. So later that same month, J.E. Baker returns to Whitewater to assist with the undertaking until a sale of the business can be negotiated. In November 1921, Brainerd and Crabtree assume ownership of the furniture and undertaking in Whitewater. Frank Crabtree had already been managing the furniture and undertaking business in Burns, which was also owned by Frank Bishop. Howard Brainerd was a local resident as well. In 1922, Frank Crabtree buys the furniture and undertaking business in Poplin. We believe Hossman and Hawk had continued their services from 1917 until 1922. The address of the two businesses appear to be the same on East Marshall Street. Crabtree closed the business at the end of 20, uh, 1924. There is no further record of an undertaking service in Poplin. In September 1922, Hylas and Harold Smith purchased the business from Brainerd and Crabtree. The Smith brothers purchased new funeral equipment, including furnishings for a chapel or home wake. The practice of holding a wake or watch is not obsolete, but is quite rare today. In January 1927, the Smith brothers offer an ambulance service, and that is the first mention of that service in Whitewater. April 1930. Fire destroys the buildings of Corver Motor Company, the Ford dealer, and Smith Brothers Furniture and Undertaking. Remember the new brick building built by C.E. Francis in 1908 that replaced an old wood fire trap? This is it. In all fairness, the fire started in the Corver building and spread to the Smith building, which was, like we said, it was made from brick. The undertaking and funeral equipment was nearly all salvaged, so the fire did not affect that service. Nineteen thirty-nine, Hyla Smith died, and Harold purchased his brother's share. And the name was changed from Smith Brothers to Smith Mortuary. 
In the 1950s, a young man began helping Harold Smith and with, with embalming and other duties as necessary. And in early in 1959, a young man and his wife, Bob and May Lamb, purchased the Smith Mortuary. The name was cha changed to Lamb Mortuary. In 1959, Bob buys a station wagon, which does double duty as a family car and an ambulance. Only children growing up in that atmosphere would be willing to accept that, I'm sure. It also included oxygen equipment. And in January of 1960, Bob purchased a commercial ambulance funeral car. This is the 1961 photo of the Lamb Mortuary, the Chevrolet building you see towards the back. And the mortuary is the same location and proximity of the Corver and Smith buildings at the time of the fire in 1930. So these are the buildings that were, re that were built from uh, that fire. 1987, Bruce Nutter purchased a share of the business and operated as Land Nutter Mortuary. In 1997, Bob started the Bob Lamb Funeral Home, one block south of the other institution in town. We had two funeral homes. Uh, there are always jokes about how do you tell when you have a dying town. Uh, there's two more trays. <laughs> Ty Ziner. Purchased Lamb and Nutter Mortuary and Bob Lamb Funeral Home in 2004 and operated locally as Lamb Funeral Home until 2019. In 2019, Yazel Megley bought the Lamb Funeral Home and continued to operate their whitewater facility under that name. In April of 2021, Bob Lamb's name and memorial service schedule on the building from which he served the families and the community for so many years. And what a great couple that was, Bob and May. So that concludes the undertakers. Uh, I can address questions now or, or you can hold them until afterwards. Anything about the undertakers? So traditionally, ambulances start out being under undertakers rather Correct. than hospitals? Correct. They had a vehicle that could hold a, a stretcher. Is that currently a licensed by bus uh, matter by business or individual? You have to be licensed to have such a a business or the the undertaker the undertaker mortuary. business yeah yes that's like that's highly regulated state highly regulated by state i don't know that for sure uh i know there are different rules in different states so it must be pretty much state state operated i can look on the zoom on your computer, I can look on and see if anybody. Yeah, those of you on Zoom can can also. Uh, looks like there are some questions on Zoom, so I'll just pull it up and, and read them some of them. Uh, none of his photos are showing. Um, well, um, but I think I think um, I think that might be just Janice that's having that problem because they are coming through on the Facebook live stream. So if any other other than Janice is not seeing the photos on Zoom, you can switch over to the Facebook live and, and you'll see them there. Um, so there's that answer for Janice. And then Sarah asks, were the two lambs related? I'm guessing they were. Right? Robert and Bob are the same. Oh, they're the same person. So okay. yeah, for, if Robert and Bob was causing the confusion, it, that is the same person. I noticed on the first ad for lamb, it said phone seven nine. 
Was that the first one that had a phone? I the, see that caught my attention. I didn't see the, it the Smith brothers had a phone okay. too. Uh, those that were at the last program I did here <laughs> would know that date. Uh, I don't remember now when the phones got started. Yes. There's a Baker furniture slash uh, funeral in Peabody today. In their in a number of years, as far as I know, are they the same one that was there in the 1880s? It is. It's the same, same family. Yeah, it's the same family. It's totally a big sign there. They have they have a facility in in uh, Valley Center. Uh, I'm not sure how much else they have, but it is a, it is the same family. I actually rode in Bob Lamb's ambulance to go home. He was a mail carrier and yes. a master, and my dad was a mail carrier, and I had that surgery when I was in my teens in Kansas City, and Bob gave dad that to take me home in my body cast. Wow. Wow. And people could see in the windows, and there I was with my bright colored <laughs> outfit. Wait. <Wow. laughs> It was a long ride, though. It was a long ride, no doubt. We have a question in back. Can you explain more about the wake? The wake? It, it was a practice. Uh, I think primarily among certain church people where they watched over the, the body of the deceased. Um, didn't it need to be for two years, uh, two days, two days that they, I think it was 48 hours. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I can't explain what the purpose was, but that's what it was. Somebody had to be with them the entire time. So these furnishings that Smith purchased was, was a couch and a, and a blanket and a rug and that sort of thing that would contribute to a greater comfort for those that were involved with that. It could be done in a home or it could be done at the at the uh, mortuary chapel. Can you be in the living room they have a picture of this often right there in the living room and they have a stuck there for our And they were mm -hmm. associate. I associate with like the Irish ethnicity. Yeah, it's a party. But the Irish is a party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we'll go on with the cemeteries. There are a few aspects of cemeteries to notice as we go down through this list. Uh, chronology, the variety and uniqueness of cemeteries, the seasonal beauty of these parks and the stories. Uh, don't miss the stories. <laughs> this seems to be locked up. Let's see what's going on here. There we go. Said it. All right. An early funeral was simpler than what we may consider today. Often it was a small gathering of family and a few neighbors or friends. The burial was likely to be in a corner of the farmstead or near the house. Regardless of the cause of death, following the burial, work and life continued in as normal a process as possible. That is seen here as the cowboys pause with their hats in hand and horses ready. The Johnson Cemetery is the oldest one on record from the 1850s. And for a long time, this was all I knew about it. Uh, William Joseph Houston arrived from North Carolina, August 1, 1879, and settled in Murdoch Township. Across a creek north of the Houston home, 
is a cemetery containing three graves surrounded by a rock wall. This is the story. Long before 1879, the Johnson family had a dugout on the creek bank that is now part of the Houston land. The Johnsons were buffalo hunters making their money from hides and furs. The parents died of smallpox and were buried by their sons, who then left with wagon and oxen for Cowskin Creek to kill bison. Out on the prairies, they ran out of food. One brother returned to the dugout for flour. When he failed to reappear on the hunting grounds, the other brother made the tedious trip back to the dugout and there found him dead on the floor, an Indian's arrow through his heart. The brother was buried beside the parents. The surviving brother then joined one of the many caravans of Arkansasers and Southerners crossing this country on the way to California. So there's two clues here that will help us date uh, this particular cemetery. Uh, one has to do with the buffalo. Uh, by the late 1850s, most of them were gone from here, from this area. And then the caravan headed for California would have been shortly after, within a decade or so after 1849. So uh, that gives us a, a pretty good clue. Uh, a third one, if we want to use that would be where it says long before 1879. The description of the burial location in the article is deceptive or confusing at best. By that, it would seem to be on the north side of the river, where it says across the river, from the Houston homestead. That assumption resulted in three separate thorough searches of all sections near the homestead with a north bank. So uh, if you can see the orange arrows gives you possible burial sites according to that description. And the blue arrow designates the, where the Houston homestead was. Each search of this property was discharged with full intention to apologize if caught trespassing. None of those searches produced the desired results. Interviews with neighbors, neighboring farmers, and others interested in local history netted no usable information. Nothing to substantiate or validate the legend was found in any other printed material. In other words, the article that I just read to you is it. And that was in a published book. After nearly three years of mulling this around, I concluded that floods, eroding riverbank, grazing wild or domestic animals, and human ignorance about the stones had completely destroyed all evidence of this historic cemetery. I found one more possible resource. In this age of instant communication, proliferation of portable digital devices and multiple social connection possibilities, there is no list to consult to find anyone. I was able to locate a physical address of a man who had been associated with the Houston property for some years. I chose to drive 30 to 45 minutes to his house in hopes I might find him there, or at least someone who would be willing to give me a phone number for future communication. He was home. I immediately delved into the reason of my visit and observed his comfort with the subject. As I relayed information I had on the Johnson Cemetery, he confirmed that it was similar to information he had received from his grandfather. His great-grandfather had homesteaded an adjoining quarter section. Then I mentioned my assumption of the burial site being on the north bank of the river. He disagreed. It was actually on the south bank of a significant turn in the river as it flowed from south to west. After responding positively to my inquiry of him seeing the cemetery in recent years, he supplied me with a good description of how to find the correct loop of the river. I thanked him sincerely and was on my way. Significant daylight remained to afford a drive-by of the old Houston property for a survey of the place according to my new intelligence. 
once my wife and I were there and evaluated our next procedure, I just said, I'm going hunting. And she agreed. <laughs> we drove to a spot within a quarter mile of our best guess of the cemetery location. Parked the pickup and started hiking along the edge of the river. And right where we had hoped, there it was. We would not have been able to see the ruins if the trees and underbrush had leaves. The early green sprouts of the day lilies over and around the graves stood out in contrast to the brown color of winter grass. Although in serious disrepair, the rock border was obvious. There was no evidence of a rock, rock wall as described. The entire cemetery is probably in better condition than one might imagine it to be after 170 years of near obscurity. No doubt, as the gentleman had described to me, the current condition is due to the careful care given to the grave sites by a daughter of William Houston, who homesteaded there. She had assumed responsibility of planting flowers, straightening the border, and whitewashing the markers every four or five years. She died in 1973. The Johnson Cemetery is bordered by flat limestone rocks stacked somewhat on edge. Three sides of the eight by 12 foot enclosure still exist, albeit with some gaps. The east side has seemed to have sunk away. Within the border are two limestone markers. The third marker nearest the east side had also disappeared there would not have been any engraved marble headstones for this cemetery. The entire border area was covered with daylily sprouts. Two large trees have grown up inside the border. The northeast corner of the cemetery is within two feet of the riverbank, the bank being an eight to 10 foot vertical drop to the normal water level. All of this happened Saturday, three days ago. It was it was such a fun find. I'll tell you what. After, like I mentioned, after three years of trying to get some more information uh, on this on this cemetery, uh, to be able to find that was was fantastic. The river continues to cut. It's the Whitewater River. It continues to cut away right at the corner of that cemetery. How long that could be there is anybody's guess, um, but it's it's intact except for a few stones that are missing along the east border. So the Adams Cemetery uh, began in 1864 with the burial of George W. Adams. Uh, most recent burial was in 1883. There are 12 burials at this site. The uh, five headstones make up the Adams family memorial and are inside a fenced area. The other seven graves are of friends and neighbors. Of those graves, only two markers are visible. And this is one of those two. The Schaefer Caribou, the township cemetery. It is actually located about uh, It'd be less than a half a mile from where the Johnson family was buried. Schaefer was the original landowner. Caribou was the name of the post office located a half mile north of the cemetery site. And we've got one person in here that would be interested in this. William McCraner was the first postmaster of that Caribou post office. This is the Union Cemetery, also a town, township cemetery, started in 1871. The cemetery serves the Palmyra community between Whitewater and Benton. This is the Haldeman, the township cemetery north of Potwin. The name is not Holderman, as is often seen and heard. It is Haldeman. It's the name of the uh, uh, I believe it was the first burials in that cemetery 
and it includes these four uh, tall stones that you see. Golden Eaves. You might be thinking that is a pleasant, peaceful name for a cemetery. And it is, but the name is not just an arbitrary choice. Joseph Golden and his wife Harriet were both born in England in 1832 and 1834, respectively. They were married on January 25, 1853, and came to America in 1865. Six years later, they moved from Illinois to Homestead on Section 18 in Richland Township, Harvey County. Shortly afterward, in 1872, at the age of 40, Joseph Golden died. He was buried just to the east of a natural spring in the corner of his farm and a headstone placed on his grave. The farm was left to his wife, Harriet. Two years later, in 1874, Harriet married a widowed neighbor named Thomas Eaves, who was also born in England. His wife, Mary Jane, had died too in 1872. Thomas Eaves died in 1913. Harriet sold the farm of her first husband in 1917 to Howard Brainerd. Uh, she died in 1922, apparently living in Dawson County, Nebraska at the time. But what you see in this picture is a modern stone and a, what appears to be three line, separate limestones there. Legend, as told by a local resident whose lifetime would have included memory of the 1920s, leads us to believe there are two other burials in this cemetery, neither of which were formally recorded. A written account of the legend has since been added to township records. A young woman lost a limb in a farming accident. That limb was buried in the cemetery. The woman was later buried there as well. This may explain the presence of three limestone markers. Any dates of the accident or eventual death of the woman are unknown. The new stone there, or the new marker in the cemetery is only memorial as the deceased's ashes were spread at his request rather than buried. This is one of the most famous cemeteries in our community along First Street. It's the Hayes uh, gravesite. Stories of the reason this cemetery exists. One is that a soldier died, possibly of gangrene, while the infantry was passing through the area and was buried along the trail. Another is that he was part of a caravan heading west after the war. He died en route and was buried at this location. The fact is that Horace Hayes was born on December 27, 1830 in Clinton, Ohio. He served with Company K of the 199th Pennsylvania Infantry during the Civil War. After the war, Horace, his wife, Serena, and their son, George, moved to Kansas and homesteaded in Pleasant Township, Harvey County. Horace died September 11, 1872, on his farm at the age of 41 and was buried under a tree at the south edge of his farm near the farmhouse. George married and had a family of 10 children before moving from the farm in 1901. And Serena Hayes died in Kingman in 1910. The stone is, the uh, inscription in the stone is still readable and along with the Bronze Star uh, validate his uh, veteran status. The Lone Star, Olinger, or Fairmont Township Cemetery began in 1872. The Green Valley Cemetery near Furley was established in 1872. The town of Furley was established in 1887. Gnadenberg is the church cemetery. The Michelin Mennonite 
settlement in Polish Russia immigrated to the U.S. between 1874 and 1878. Many of these people settled in Pleasant Township, Harvey County. The local church was organized in 1875 as Gnadenberg Mennonite Church. They met in the Star School until 1882 when their first building was completed. Their first cemetery was established in Section 35 on 40 acres originally given to the church by the railroad. The cemetery is one mile south of the current church building. The Gnadenberg Cemetery is not active. There is no driveway from the township road to the cemetery site, a distance of about 100 yards. Of the 59 known burials in the cemetery, only 17 headstones remain. If you should choose to visit the cemetery, it would be wise to do so during the season when the poison ivy is dormant. It's prolific there. <clears throat> the Emmaus Cemetery, uh, we say old here because there's two of them. Uh, the, old, the, the original Emmaus Cemetery was started in 1877. The church uh, was organized in 1876. When one is focused on a particular subject or research, it is not out of the ordinary to locate something that may not otherwise be noticed. Thus was my experience when I spotted this grim mound in the front yard of a homestead. I stopped and respectfully asked about the fresh grave. It was a waterline leak. <laughs> the Zion Church Cemetery uh, began in 1878. The Zion Mennonite Church building was located south of the cemetery from 1883 until a new building was built in Elving in 1924. Pleasant View Cemetery. Uh, this was uh, started in 1879. Land was donated by Philo Hunter, first burial being his wife. Minerva. The city of Elbing was established in 1887, and this cemetery primarily serves that community. Potlin Township Cemetery was uh, started in 1883. Uh, William Joseph deeded the cemetery to the Potlin Christian Church. And it was later given to the township for maintenance and care. This is the Harder Cemetery, which is a family cemetery east of Whitewater. Um, there are 23 graves as of 2020. I don't know of any burials there since then. This cemetery was given to the Mass Church in the 1940s. The Milton Cemetery Association was organized December of 1887. Note the names in the top paragraph there of John Stewart, P.E. Ashenfelter, and a couple lines down, Jason Ham. Those names will come up again in just a minute. The Brainerd Cemetery or the Milton Cemetery Association started in 1887. Brainerd was, had been established in 1885. Here's a clipping from the Brainerd Ensign newspaper, the remains of Mrs. Margaret Stewart, wife of John Stewart and Herbert, son of Jason Ham, were removed to the new cemetery yesterday. These were the first internments made in that place. So notice the timeline. If you did a search in the Brainerd Cemetery, the earliest death date you would find is Blanche Ashenfelter, uh, the wife of P.E. Ashenfelter. Uh, she died on July 11, 1882. Margaret Stewart died February 28, 1887. Herbert Ham died October 8, 1887. The cemetery wasn't organized until December of 1887. 
The first burials were February 22, 1888, that of Margaret and Herbert. Two events commonly happened as community cemeteries were established. Remains that had been buried on the farm or in a distant cemetery, for instance, were removed to the local cemetery, or remains would be left where buried, but a memorial stone would be set in the local cemetery. It is common in the early cemeteries that the founding of the cemetery, the first burial, and the earliest death dates do not agree. So keep that in mind as you do, do your searches. The McGill Cemetery, uh, south of Potwin, the first burial there was Benton McGill in 1888 in the northeast corner of his farm. Mrs. McGill later deeded the cemetery to the Potwin Methodist Church. So both the Potwin churches got a cemetery and both of them became township maintained. In the 2008 photo on the left, the name is McGill. In the 2022 photo, the name appears to be McGill's, but it seems obvious that the S is of a different font. Mm -hmm. In the third photo, not shown, uh, there are two S's in the font set at 45 degree angles in the top corners as a decorative flare. Whether the change was intentional, done as a practical joke, or result of vandalism is unknown. Uh, regardless, nobody has attempted to correct it. The Grace Hill Cemetery began in 1890. The Gnadenberg Cemetery had been used for 17 years. I believe the church people refer to these cemeteries as the new cemetery and the old cemetery. Uh, I chose to use the Gnadenberg just because of that, uh, the name of the church at that time. In 1951, the Gnadenberg group voted to build a new building. It was completed in 1953, and at that time also determined to change the name to Grace Hill. In May 1892, a meeting notice was published for anyone in Whitewater or Richland Township of Harvey County who was interested in establishing a cemetery for the area. The Whitewater, now a city cemetery, was started in 1892. Whitewater had been established in 1890. We will jump ahead in time to September 1957. Here's a, a notice from the newspaper that the Whitewater Cemetery Association transfers title of cemetery to the city of Whitewater. This is the only area city maintained cemetery that most of them uh, were well, pretty well divided between township and church cemeteries. So the Swiss cemetery, the original building was to the north of that cemetery. The, the Swiss group had organized in 1886, but had been meeting in the local schoolhouse. This is a little cemetery along uh, Rock Road. 1901, Elmer died of scarlet fever at the age of two. The younger siblings died within minutes of birth. The cemetery is on what was the grandfather's land, and only this one marker is visible. But there are three burials there. Mission missionary uh, Church Cemetery, uh, west of Elby, started in 1906. The missionary church had begun in 1902 and met in the foster school until 1910. The building was built and used in Elbing until the group moved to Newton in 1968. This is an Ents grave, family cemetery, just a single grave. 
It was an infant death, and the burial was on the farm near the farmhouse. The Lorraine Avenue Mennonite Church in Wichita has a cemetery uh, south and east of Furley. And this was started in 1982. And the new Emmaus Church Cemetery, I haven't come up with any of the names for them. And again, those church people just call it the old and the new. Uh, was started in 2017. Richard Weeby was the first burial in the cemetery. He had made the land available for the new church building and this cemetery after the church building fire in 2009. Those are the cemeteries that, uh, that are marked. Uh, and then as far as unmarked, uh, we have to make mention of, of a couple of them here. An unmarked grave is determined by the absence of a physical marker, but having the burial and or the location described within a published document or written family history. So if there's something written about it, uh, we still consider it to be a, a cemetery. This is what I've been calling the Harms Family Cemetery. It is just to the west of the Gnadenberg Cemetery. Uh, this group of trees survives because at one time they marked the graves. We don't know how many. Uh, the, the records were have been lost or destroyed. Uh, I understand there's a possibility of them being stolen, uh, which kind of baffles a, a normal human being. So information on this site has actually become oral tradition. This is remembered as a site of an unknown number of graves. Uh, and again, the, the uh, particularly the Grace Hill uh, community and church people that I've talked to have brought up the name Harms as the family. We have Harmses here tonight that didn't know that. <laughs> Was so there, the old so there you are. Yeah. <laughs> this is from a uh, uh, the Peter Zerker Heritage Sketchbook compiled in 2003. Other sorrows came to the Zerker family in 1887 and 1888. Little Werner was born to Peter and Elise in 1887, but lived only nine days. Then the next year, Emma died at age four in an accident on a stairway. The Swiss church had not yet built their building and did not have a cemetery. The two children, therefore, were buried between the two driveways in the yard of the Zerker farm home. For many years, rose bushes marked the site of the two little graves. Was that outside of Whitewater? This was just outside of Whitewater. A descendant who was raised on the, this Peter Zerker homestead recalls those rose bushes. Her description was midway between the driveways, just like we read, about 15 feet from the road ditch. Uh, so up here beside the sign, maybe you can see a little orange box. It's not real clear on the screen. Uh, but that is the area uh, where we believe those two graves are, just about midway between the sign and that next uh, cedar tree. As far as unknown cemeteries, these are primarily burials without documentation that carry an oral tradition or high probability of existence. Specific location is generally unknown. These would include Indian burial grounds uh, and burials that happened along the trails. The Cherokee Trail goes right through our area there past the, actually through Potwin and, and close to Elbing. Uh, so the probability, like I say, is high that there would be some burials along that trail. 
and and any of those deaths could have been natural cause accident violence uh, so uh, we're sure they're out there there's no way of knowing where on farm burials uh, that may carry an oral tradition uh, for instance a domestic help and, and this is a story I'm familiar with domestic help who died had no local family they buried her out uh, behind the barn and although the farmstead still exists we have no knowledge of which barn which side of the barn is behind or if that barn actually remains so these are considered to be unknown cemeteries now for a cemetery mystery There's a legend with variations which affect the east side of the Brainerd Cemetery. Jake Cornelius was a lifelong resident of the Brainerd area. Jake was interviewed in 2001 by Kevin Rowe, then of Toronto, Ontario. Kevin was a graduate student at the University of Kansas who chose to return to the earliest address of his maternal grandmother, for the subject of a graduate requirement. That place was Brainerd, Kansas. The subsequent research and interviews resulted in a paper titled Brainerd, Kansas, Time, Place, and Memory on the Plains. And this is how Jake described the legend of local event. Um, we'll start there in the middle. En route, we stopped at the peaceful Brainerd Cemetery and Jake related the local legend of a group of immigrants who were found frozen to death in a boxcar and later were buried in unmarked mass grave here in this peaceful grove. In 2016, Brian Stuckey visited the Brainerd, Kansas Cemetery, and in his words, I did so to douse, flag, and document spaces in the cemetery that were said to be the burial places of persons who died in a little-known story. What little I know of this story is this, and this is how he words it. In early days, the Missouri Pacific Railroad ran through Brainerd. It grew to a considerable town. At one point, Date unknown, the train made a stop at Brainerd. Upon opening one boxcar, workers discovered that a number of unauthorized riders or stowaways had died, possibly of suffocation, in one boxcar. The victims were likely indigents or immigrants. The bodies were taken to the Brainerd Cemetery and buried. The location of the burials in the cemetery was unknown. So, personally, what time period are they thinking about? That That's a good question. We'll see if we can work on that just a bit here. So uh, there have been variations of the legend. Like I've mentioned, uh, people died by heat, cold, suffocation, disease, and violence. The boxcar was opened immediately to unload freight, or it was left on the siding for a time before investigating and finding this grizzly scene. And there was never in these stories a specific number of victims. So this is a map of the Brainerd Cemetery with the results of Brian's investigation. 10 individual grave locations were identified within the area of the yellow box. The size of the graves indicated both juvenile and adult allowing us to think it was a family rather than rail workers or hobo transients. And let me stop here and ask, are you familiar with the concept of dousing for graves? I think most everybody is. Uh, there are a couple of notes, so I will try to explain. Uh, it is something similar to water witching, uh, where the operator uses uh, a light rod or a wire bent in a 90 degree, uh, kind of an L shape and holds them in his hands. 
And as he walks across the cemetery or uh, the place that's being searched, uh, those wires will cross or they'll go both go the same direction and whatnot. And an experienced operator can determine the uh, soil where the soil has been disturbed by doing that. And it has proven to be quite accurate. Uh, and Brian has, has been uh, uh, very good at that. So uh, that's how the search was, was conducted. Wouldn't an event like this have the sheriff write up a report to the local police because of the possibility of homicide? You think so? <laughs> it depends on the time period. Yeah. <laughs> Various research has been, been conducted over a period of years regarding this. Some cemetery records have been searched. Past cemetery sextants were interviewed to obtain any burial verification. Local and regional newspapers have been searched for possible reports of a train incident. Coroner reports and records were searched to try to discover any information on these deaths. The Missouri Pacific Museum curator was interviewed about such an incident. Absolutely nothing. There is no record at all. Uh, Mel Epp, past president of the Frederick Remington Area Historical Society and local historian. Kim Fields, local genealogy and history researcher. Brian Stuckey, already introduced myself and others, have contributed time and research towards some discovery of this mystery. And the results just seem to raise more questions. So what do we have? We have a legend. We have a few unmarked graves. We have a cemetery plat map with the inclusion of a potter's field. That's what the blue arrows here are pointing to the potter's field. Uh, and the knowledge that any train incident at Brainerd would have happened after July 1, 1885. That was when the first train came through. Um, the concept of a potter's field is not common in Butler County. The, there are cemeteries who have designated an area of their cemetery for indigent burials but it's not labeled as such on the plat. So having this potter's field here is kind of curious. So what questions remain? When did this event occur? We don't know. Why is a potter's field included in the cemetery? Did the cemetery committee already know of 10 bodies that needed permanent burial? Where did the deaths happen? They were found in a boxcar. It could have been miles away. Wouldn't an incident of this magnitude generate some mention in a newspaper or in the cemetery log or in the, any law records? Could the railroad squelch publicity? Were community members involved in the burials? If so, wouldn't we have more information on what happened? If there were that many bodies to deal with at one time, wouldn't a mass grave have been more efficient or practical? And Jake mentioned that, and yet Brian found 10 individual graves. Were the 10 graves that were located all dug at the same time? If not, could they be legitimate indigent burials? And if that is the case, do we even have a legendary incident? That one will remain unsolved, I'm, I'm quite sure. From Brian's dowsing, where he made that map and showed the, the 10 the big rectangles, that match the location of the Potter's Field? It's the Potter's Field is right along the east side. How wide that is, I'm not sure we even know. Um, it's, you know, it, it appears to be a pretty narrow strip but it would be, uh, uh, let, me, let me back up here. 
31 feet and 11 inches is what it looks like from east to west. So that's a that's a pretty good sized area to contain those that many graves. So it, very likely it has moved over into the the planted portion of the cemetery as well. Would there still be bone potentially bone fragments? Uh, more than likely, the, some of the large bones would still be there. The skulls would be deteriorated by, by this time. Uh, again, that's that was a long time ago. Uh, and without embalming, without, uh, uh, they may not even have been placed in a, in a coffin, even a wooden box. So deterioration would, would happen more quickly. I Opinion, I think the opinions do vary about the reliability of, of dousing that's not supported by any other forms of evidence, right? I mean, uh, certainly, there's you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a there's a question about it being a science, yeah. and and uh, in that situation, there's always doubters for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, like I said before, Brian Sticky has a has a, a good record. Or locating uh, graves that were even known but unmarked. You know, we know that their grave is out here and he's able to locate it. So uh, that's all we have to go by. The guy named Vince Marshall from Valley Center that's better than Jesus. He had a program at Bush Dahl Library Saturday. Hmm. But I can't even do that. It's pretty. He did. he did not know where people were buried. I, I, have, I have seen that demonstration at. Uh, Cemetery West of Newton. It's the Halstead, Halstead First yeah. Cemetery, yeah. and then he also yeah. did the one by the Coliseum. Right. Oh, okay. And then he did a program here in the library right. too. Okay. He claimed he could tell whether it was a male or female. Yes. Correct. And and child or right. yeah. Yep. And which was the head end? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, he was tell us about the page. Uh, a male, female, whatever, and then you showed him the name and the dates, so it was actually right on. And I thought I remember the government. And I thought like magic. Well, Sam, did you do? Because he had people buy it. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Like, about it. You know, Sam, what is some quick, <laughs> one thing to consider, especially with Brian, he does a lot of research on documentation before he ever goes to do any dowsing. Yeah. So the dowsing is a confirmation of what he found in all of his research and document and documents that he has there. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't need to be yeah. inside him at all. Just, yeah. I, I just um I don't think it sounds like there's not an explanation that's been explained by science of why this should work, right? I mean, the, the research is one thing, but the actual well, like you should... said, it's kind of similar to water witching too, and you know, you know this is work a sometimes. cultural <laughs> item with respect to Brian. I'm not disparaging him. He is of Swiss Mennonite background. He did dowsing in Russian Mennonite area. And I can verify that some Russian Mennonites were skeptical of dowsing by a Swiss Mennonite. That's <laughs> certain <laughs> idea. <laughs> That's a separate matter. Okay. You know. <laughs> yes. Earlier, there were four houses. Were there cemeteries? Where people died in the four houses in the cemetery where they were buried in adjacent. That doesn't, that doesn't show up in our area. Actually, I let let, yeah, let I, heard the okay. I knew the Hollisters. They ran the four farm yeah. for a number of years. Of course, yeah. island part of that was West Down. West 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 Ellen told me there's several graves there, but she wouldn't say who or how or where. Right. Yeah. She said the the sheriff knew about it. Then there's one of the hill too. And, and like I said, in, in, in this study area, that did not show up. So 
email or some of you may know years ago I heard where is supposedly Newton's equivalent of the deal at? Well, I'm sure you can exactly. Yeah, cool. It's private property. It's private, private property. Go on East First Street, where it crosses Slate Creek, yeah. and whatever that little street is that goes off of. What direction am I in? <laughs> that, that is south. <laughs> okay, south. You've got. You've got a little street that goes south of First Street. East, east of the Slate Street, right? Yes. No, no. Right. I thought west, it was east, west of it. It's west west. Because it makes okay. a triangle there where you've got this little street like this. First Street is here, and then Slate Creek goes like this. So you've got kind of a triangle, and there's a little apartment building yeah. right here. On First Street. On First Street. Yeah. And it was all in that area right there. I was just kind of on the other side. Of I thought I heard that it was in that kind of area. On the west side of Slate Creek, on the, and there's not a whole lot of investigation that's going on there because the people who live there don't want anybody. Yeah, private. It's private. It's all private homes, except for that apartment building, which is private. I've got one more section. Uh, we just talked about a cemetery mystery, and now we'll discuss a mystery cemetery. An 1885 Milton Township map, Butler County, identifies a small cemetery in the southwest corner, in the south half of the southwest quarter of Section 28, Township 24, Milton, in Butler County. 78 acres are owned by B. Carler. So the corner sorted out would be two acres, not discounting anything for a right of way. Two questions surface. Who is B. Carler? Could this be a family burial plot? B. Carler did not show up in any census or grave searches. County cemetery records gave no indication of a cemetery at this location. And yet, you can see it as plain as I can. It's labeled right there. So the site in question is in the northeast corner of the intersection of Northwest 70 and Prairie Creek, behind, uh, beyond that pipe corner post. In 1905, the same township map shows the two-acre plot, but no longer identified as a cemetery. So what is it? Cemeteries don't normally just go away. A search of the land deeds of the Butler County Courthouse produced three pieces of helpful information. The owner was Bertha G. Carter, not Carler. She lived in Illinois. She sold the property in 1897, and the sale did not include the two-acre area. Two more questions. Did she not own it? Or did she have reason to retain ownership of that plot? Investigation of the Register of Deeds uh, Office continued. A search was done in a book which had recorded the land title transfers. What was found there finally directed us to some answers. On this page, we are most interested in the three records in the middle. There are three separate transfers all on the same date. The grantor of the small plot and the date of the recording is what is most interesting. So what we're looking at right here is the grantor is school district number 75. And it was in 1885 when that was first sold. Joel Barnes uh, was uh, was the one who purchased that. Uh, he also purchased the rest of that 80 from Bertha Carter and eventually sold it all on the same day to Bernard Entz, uh, a local farmer. So 
So now we've got a school district involved. Now it's time to refer to a book titled A Picture of a Rural School, with which I was already quite familiar. And those of you that don't know, it was another book that I produced. There's one on, there's some copies on the back table there. School District 75 was established in 1872. We had that information. Rudolf Penner needed land to School Board 75 in 1884. This 12 year lapse of time raised no concern while researching for the school book because various agreements were made between landowner and the school district in order to get a school established. For example, a lease could have been negotiated until a later time when the land could be purchased. Two acres was a common size for a school grounds plot. What we know now that was unknown at the time the school book was published is that District 75 was first located on the southwest corner of Section 28, where it says cemetery. In 1884, the school building was moved one half mile west to Penner property on section 29. The school district was disorganized in 1901 and divided among the districts of Whitewater, Brainerd, and Claypool. The property sold by auction, at which time Mr. Penner bought the land back and the building for a combined cost of $132. In 1905, a petition was filed with the county for a new school district closely resembling the geography of the earlier district that was not granted. So Mr. Barnes, owner of the North 80, purchased the two acres on the South 80 of Section 28 from the school district in 1885, the year after the school was moved. It is my personal belief that Joel Barnes and Bertha Carter were probably siblings who had received these properties through inheritance uh, from an otherwise unidentified owner at this time. That might explain the various deed transactions. Again, there are no county records that indicate that the plot might have been used as a cemetery even after 1885. This evidence might be sufficient to believe that the plot designated as a cemetery in 1885 actually never was, and that the map maker made an easy error. That concludes my presentation. Are there any more questions? Look on, I'll look on the Zoom again to see if we got some more people ask questions on there. Let's see here. Um, oh, let's see. You, you see those two there. Lisa says, where was the mineral spring? And is there still one there? Um, and then um, Robin says, I have doused in Hannibal, Missouri, and it is really interesting. The Wichita Genealogy Society did their monthly meeting on it last week. Oh, so that's thank you for that, Robin. So there we, there we have those. That mineral spring was just to the northwest of uh, of Whitewater, uh, just in across the the county line into Harvey County. Uh, there is no active spring there any longer, um, but it uh, it served as a good water source for the community for many years. Uh, as well as a source of income for Mr. Allard, just like we suggested. Yeah, but uh, Eilert or Eilerts? I mean, I knew as Eilert. There were the there were two changed. families. There were two families. There was Eilert and there was Eilerts. Okay. Yeah. They were not related that you know of? Not that I know of. What to... Uh, Sources do you do you use to determine when the cemetery was created and how many people were buried there? Obviously, one obviously as far as that is if there are stones, but stones marker could be gone, especially if it was with women. Well, uh, most of those cemeteries are found in in uh, county records, mm -hmm. and and there are. Uh, uh, historical societies and various people, organizations that go around and and uh, photograph the stones. Uh, that's an ongoing project in in most places. 
And so that's how they keep track of the number of burials in the in a cemetery, along with the sextants records. Um, that particular area was uh, really of no interest to me and the larger cemeteries, the ones that were family cemeteries, uh, it created a little bit more interest on my part. And again, those were in cemetery records that where we have 12 burials in one and 22 burials in another one and so on. So were the ones you mentioned all that you know of that were in the Remington district? Yes. I did this presentation at uh, Remington High School in November, and and I asked for assistance in locating more. And there was only one mention, and that was the, the little Ince girl that died in 1936. It's the only one that I did not know about at the time. And since then, we were also able to get that additional information on the Johnson Cemetery. Okay, well, thank you so much. This is fascinating. All right.